Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to another EDH Deck Tech. Uh, this one here is going to be featuring the new revamped mono red deck uh, featuring Squee now. Squee in the lore uh, is one of my favorite characters. He's essentially a goblin that keeps coming back uh, and was part of the crew of the Weatherlight. Uh, but without getting too much into that, uh, I just want to say I think this goblin has a lot of spicy brews. You see some play in uh, Dredge now. Uh, has been for a while and it's just a really strong card. The reason I was drawn to Squee in particular was because he solves Red's draw issue um, in sort of a roundabout way. What he's able to do is um, with spells like Tormenting Voice and Wild Guess where you would normally draw two cards and discard a card or actually have to discard the card first and then draw the cards, you discard Squee. Uh, you play him early, you, you use one of the outlets in the deck to kill him and then you have a recurrable source um, of discard fodder so that you can actually net yourselves cards uh, with those spells. So very interesting general, uh, pretty much we play Squee as fast as we can, we have a couple enchantments and a few creatures that will allow us to use Squee to generate mana, do damage, destroy non-basics, um, and draw us a ton of cards. This has been really good with the old Eldrazi shell, um, you know, the only thing I would like to experiment with at this point is a Thought Knot Seer. I think that it does something very nice for red in uh, EDH that it doesn't normally get to do. But aside from that, it's heavy top end curve Eldrazi. We have both the Ulamogs and both the Kozileks because again, exiling permanence and drawing cards is something that red has a tough time with. So we've done everything in our in our power to make sure we're getting the best of red. Um, so we're going to go into it. I'm going to show the mana package first because I think ramp is very important in a deck like this. Um, and this has become a Paradox Engine package uh, where I have enough mana rocks where I can net, you know, a tons of mana essentially. A number is kind of irrelevant after a certain point, but essentially be able to play out all my spells or generate a massive number of tokens and have mana to sacrifice them with something like a Siege Gang Commander and uh, do it as quick as possible. So uh, we've got a Mana Crypt. We've got a Soul Ring. We've got a Mana Vault. Uh, this one is uh, one to cast. Taps to add three to your mana pool. Does not untap during your untap phase. Uh, if it's tapped during your untap phase, you take a damage and you can pay four during your upkeep to untap it. Um, so interesting card, but quite strong. Um, the Mox Diamond, we run, I think, 14 non-basics uh, and 35 lands. So having a Fire Diamond is nice. It ramps us and it gets us red when sometimes we're using a, a heavy non-basic package for all the utility it gives us. Uh, next we have a Grim Monolith. Uh, it's sort of like the bigger version of the Mana Vault, uh, but you don't take a damage at the beginning of your upkeep if it's tapped, which is nice. This is a fun one. I have a soft spot for it. This is Helm of Awakening. It's all spells, even your opponents, will cost one colorless less to play. Um, yeah, that can be dangerous if you're playing a combo deck, but, um, you know, I have enough fun getting out all these rocks for one cheaper. This makes all my one-drop uh, artifacts free. Um, yeah, it makes the Eldrazi cost one less. I just, it's definitely worth it in, in this package. Uh, Mindstone, I just love Mindstone. I put it in pretty much all my EDHs. Being able to ramp and then draw a card later is pretty much uh, a generic thing an EDH deck wants to do. So along the same vein, there's the Commander's Sphere. Um, nice thing about this is you can float the mana and then sacrifice it, which you can't do with the stone. Uh, a Gilded Lotus, again, we want those red mana symbols. Tapping to add three uh, is really nice with the Paradox Engine uh, because once we start playing spells that cost less than their casting cost and are able to generate more than that with, with our mana rocks, that's when we're starting to net mana. There's a few, there's only one storm spell, it's not a grape shot, it's an empty the warrens. Um, so yeah, we have a fun <laughs> fun package to go off with an empty the warrens. Uh, Paradox Engine, there it is, whenever you cast a spell, untap all non-land permanents you control, so you saw all those mana rocks are trying to get us to netting mana. Um, other than the top end curve, the, the, the spells in this deck are very cheap. A lot of them are mana rocks and a lot of them are uh, cheap, efficient spells. So the rest of the artifact package, this is all for uh, utility and making sure you can resolve some stuff on your turn. Uh, we've got a 
expedition map, so we either get Valakut, or if we're playing counter magic, we can go get Beseju, which is in the deck, which lets us pay two life, and uh, the next instant or sorcery uh, we cast can't be countered. Got a Voltaic Key, I really like the old art, uh, just one for tapping on, untapping an artifact. Uh, Relic of Progenitus, there are a ton of wheel effects in this deck, and so this is the only way we kind of are responsible about uh, potentially giving our opponents too much advantage if they're playing a graveyard deck. Got a Skull Clamp. Again, great with Squee. Draw a ton of cards. Make some 1 1 goblins in the deck, too, so this gets us going pretty quick. Got a Scroll Rack. Very good for digging. Um, the way the deck works is generally you'll have one or two cards that are costing nine or more in your hand um, by mid game. And so being able to early on tuck those and see more cards that'll get you there faster becomes super useful. Um, I'm really happy with the card in the deck. Anvil. This is one of the best cards with Squee. Uh, it's probably one of the more known combos in EDH with Squee. Um, every player skips their discard phase, so there's no max hand size for all players. Uh, and at the beginning of everyone's upkeep, they will draw an additional card and then discard a card. Defense Grid. Um, this is an amazing card in Mono Red. Uh, I have a real passion for it. Essentially, getting this out turn one off a of Soul Ring or uh, a Mana Crypt kind of guarantees that you're going to be resolving your spells even against counter decks uh, for the majority of the game. And after that point, it's very hard for control decks to, to interact uh, with the setup that you're producing. And, and quite often, it's the safest way to get those Eldrazi out, you know, turn four or five, um, depending on how well you're your plan of attack is going. Sometimes it can happen that quick. So great card. Also combos very nicely with uh, Price of Glory, which is an enchantment that will come up in a moment. Uh, Lightning Greaves, just good to have a Lightning Greaves. I don't have um, Haste Enablers in this deck uh, other than the Greaves. I just, uh, well, I do have a couple others. That's that's not true. I took out quite a few though. Uh, Greaves stayed because often we're pay playing one big Eldrazi and then going in. That's my cat, Franklin. Just meowing up a storm. I know, bud. I know. Uh, okay. Next up is Mind's Eye. These last two artifacts are the top end of the artifact curve, and they're just made for drawing cards. Um, this is a great card. I love this card in EDH, and I think it should be played in more red decks specifically, because it's one of the only ways you're going to get above seven cards in your hand during a game. Normally, what happens with red is you'll wheel. You'll get to seven, but you'll never really see more than seven. That's not really how red filters through its cards. Uh, Mind's Eye is an exception that lets you do that. And finally, we have a memory jar. Um, this will let us crack this for free uh, after playing it for five at any point. And what that'll do uh, is you get a fresh set of hand, uh, <laughs> fresh set of hands. We'll just cut off the ones you have. No. Um, so every player, not just you, is going to put their hand face down and draw seven cards. At the end of the turn, they discard those seven, and they take the cards they set aside back into their hand. So it's just a good way to get a fresh grip real, really fast. Um, try and cheat out some Eldrazi if you have your sneak attack in play. Yeah, there is a sneak attack. It's kind of nasty, uh, but it's not, you know, super reliable, so it's just another part of the uh, puzzle <laughs> for getting out the monsters real quick. So, yeah, you generally want to see some ramp, uh, some rocks, um, anything that will get you co closer to popping off with Paradox Engine or playing uh, some Eldrazi. So now, next up, we have some enchantments here. This is a really small enchantment package, um, but I'm pretty happy with it. So we've got a Goblin Barbarbin, which lets us sacrifice any creature to ping for one, a creature or player. Um, yeah, pretty good with Squee. Oh, the other thing about Helm of Awakening, too, is it makes Squee cost two. And that actually adds up when you have utility cards like the ones I'm going to be showing you. Um, Here's another, Shivan Harvest, which is a psychic like creature to destroy non-basic for two. So then that becomes four mana, uh, which feels fine, which is kind of the average <laughs> cost back in the day for, for red to pop something with the Avalanche Riders or whatnot. Um, yeah, I mean, they always had Stone Rain, but on a creature body, it's generally a little more. 
So here's Price of Glory, next enchantment. This is the one that combos with Defense Grid. So if you have Defense Grid in play, it'll cost your opponent an additional 3 uh, to cast a spell on your turn, and then you destroy all the lands they tap uh, if they're trying to do that on your turn. Um, yeah, so pretty much fully dissuading them from interacting with you uh, when you're trying to get out your Eldrazi with some haste. Uh, sneak Attack is the last enchantment. Uh, this is a really, really strong card, and pretty much when you have this in play, you're looking to wheel as fast as you can. Um, wheeling will just get you to your big creatures that you can play for one. Uh, there's even a Magus of the Wheel, which can uh, you can cheat out for one and then crack another time. Um, yeah. Not another time, but if you wheel into it, yeah. You get it. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna have a supporter here actually. It's a lot of talking. Okay, now we are into the creature package. As you can see by uh, this smirk of the skirk, uh, we are into the goblin package. The goblin package is five creatures. Uh, I have a light, efficient <laughs> package here. We have some support in our spells with a hordling outburst and an empty the wards, but. You'll see we've got the Skirk Prospector, which lets our uh, Squee add one. Um, this is a really, really strong card when you get some tokens out, because you're pretty much guaranteed to be getting out a massive creature turn four, or five, um, six at the latest. Next up is the Goblin Welder. This is an awesome card with all the artifact shenanigans. Uh, you saw the memory jar, things like that. Um, yeah, we can just get a ton of hands going really fast, play out all our spells uh, when we're kind of in the late game. It's a good win con card uh, because we'll have enough mana to really take advantage of flipping things in and out of the yard and generating profit off of it. Goblin Matron. Uh, so one of, the, one of the five goblins is actually a tutor for another goblin. Um, the reason is all these goblins, as you as you see, are just uh, utility that work with Squee. Um, the next one is Krenko, uh, really great boots target. You can get Squee down turn three in a slow game, and then uh, put out Krenko turn four. And if you have boots, then you're already making two tokens that turn thanks to Squee, so that's nice. Uh, otherwise, it just interacts well with any other goblin really. Good way, good way of stalling mid-game and creating blockers, which is what we want to be doing if we're not wiping the board with fire. Uh, Siege Gang Commander is the final goblin. He uh, is a win con. We produce a lot of... If we Mizzix Mastery with one of our goblin spells in the graveyard, we're generally producing a ton of mana and having the option of uh, sacrificing numerous goblins to do lots of damage. Also just a great way to throw Squee and, and trade for creatures your opponents need. Uh, these are the utility creatures, Magus of the Wheel, uh, lets us wheel for two. Um, yeah, good card. Three for a three, three. It's pretty good. Doesn't get much better than that for a good ability as well. Haste um, off of the Yanger is pretty much a classic. Very nice in this deck because we do run all of the two to cast spells that force us to discard a card and then draw two. So, um, really nice to see Anger and one of those because you are actually getting value out of the card you're discarding. Uh, a Solemn Simulacrum, uh, pretty generic. We do have uh, a lot of Hellfire coming up, so you'll see uh, why it's nice to hit the bin and draw a card, but you probably already know because Solemn Simulacrum is a staple. Uh, Urbrask, this is a nice way to slow down our opponents, speed up our board state, uh, especially when we play our first big creature. Uh, it just gets to go in the turns played, and 5444 is sizable. Combustible Gear Hulk is really nice with the Goblin Welder. It's one of my favorite targets other than the Memory Jar. Um, yeah, with Top Curve going up to 12, uh, the highest casting creature is the it That Betrays. We do run that. Uh, there has been a game already where uh, an opponent has chosen the flip, and uh, one was a Kozilek, the other was an Ulamog, and they took 20 and just scooped. Uh, so crazy things can happen. Generally, you're going to do about, I don't know, six-ish, uh, unless they hit some lands. 
but yeah, late game when you're putting pressure on them, the life totals are getting low, drawing three is uh, going to indirectly seal their fate often. We've got one worm, worm coil, worm, 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 worm. Uh, one worm coil engine. Uh, yeah, only life linker in the deck. Very good with board wipes. Very good with uh, sneak attack because we get the tokens even though it's sacrificed at the end of turn. Doing pretty good for time. I'm very passionate about this deck, so this might be twenty something minutes. Um, stick with me. I'll let you know when we're at lands. <laughs> uh, so here's the Eldrazi package. Starts at a 6 CMC. This is why I'm thinking of adding the Thought Knots here. Um, just having one more lower uh, Eldrazi would be kind of nice. But I'm very fond of the package. Conrad of Ruin is terrific. If Squee uh, is in your hand, he will cost one. It's one of the best things you can do with his ability if you're not playing Giant Eldrazi. So he works... Uh, Perfectly. I mean, honestly, I couldn't ask for a better ability that fuels both of the strategies. Void when War gives us access to some control that uh, Red doesn't normally have. They can't even do even things. Uh, and it's 9 for 11-9, which is terrific. Next up is the Artisan of Kozilek. This is a terrific card. I'm sure you already know that. Uh, 9 for a 10-9. Annihilator 2, that gets to reanimate one of your creatures when it enters the field, or sorry, is when it's cast, is, um, yeah, it's great. I need to hit any El other Eldrazi that I've pitched, and I've netted a massive amount of value. Even sometimes pulling out a Solemn so that I have a blocker is nice. Um, but pretty much happy to hit anything in the deck when I play uh, Artisan. Uh, Pathraiser, this was a final addition to the Eldrazi package. I realized um, this is actually quite a competitive deck. Um, it's like casually competitive, because if I go up against super competitive decks, it's probably going to lose the majority of the time. Um, but having early access to Annihilator is a good way to establish uh, an advantage that they can't come back from. So I chose Pathraiser just for the potential opportunity to sneak attack into it early game. Uh, have the Annihilator 3 trigger, and uh, they will take 9 because, you know, I'd be impressed if they had uh, 3 blockers out. Uh, depends how competitive the deck is, a, you know, very competitive deck could do it quite quick. Um, this deck sucks against stacks, by the way. Don't ever play it against a stacks deck, you'll cry. Uh, <laughs> hit that betrays. Uh, yeah, this is, a big, this is the biggest, baddest dude uh, on the field. All the Annihilator is in this deck, all the top end Annihilator that is. Um, so yeah, two creatures with Annihilator swinging, swinging in, or even if that betrays swinging in with some boots as the turn it comes into play, nets me two permanents, uh, and it's, yeah, just a value card. So then we have the two Kozilex, uh to fill up our hand, um, and we have the two Ulamogs, um, to exile permanence. So this is kind of the core of the package. We want to see these creatures. Um, this is what we tutor for generally uh, with our it that betray or sorry, our uh, conduit of ruin and our eye of Ugin. Um, we go into any one of these four spells. We're generally uh, either clearing up what we can't deal with or refilling our hand, uh, and we've established a massive threat onto the board at the same time. All of these triggers are on cast triggers, so even if they're countered, we're at least accomplishing the objective, which is filling the gaps for what red can't cover normally. Uh, so this is why I built the deck. Uh, I think, you know, having access to some a package like this is just super cool. Red generally struggles as a monocolored EDH, uh, but I'm very passionate about playing it as a color. I played it for a long time. And uh, slowly but surely, I've been working on ways to fill out all the weaknesses. Um, so now we're into the spells. Uh, there's a he healthy spell package here. I'll try and pick it up a bit, uh, just for time's sake. We've got, for the wheels, uh, a Wheel of Fortune and a Reforge the Soul, which we can Miracle for two. Works very well with Scroll Rack. Then for our filter cards, 
that work with Squee, we have a Faithless Looting, because we always want a Faithless Looting in Mono Red. Uh, we have a Cathartic Reunion, which lets us discard two to draw three. We have a Tormenting Voice, discard one to draw two. A Wild Guess, uh, discard one to draw two. Then we have a Red's Only Tutor, um, really fun sometimes, really horrible other times, Gamble. Uh, the only safe time you can get away with gambling is if you have something like a Goblin Walder and you're able to bring back a, a good artifact you searched up in the chance you discard it. Other than that, uh, Gamble is truly a gamble and uh, yeah, it's what you got in red. It's, it's kind of fun, you know, I'm not super competitive. Um, so I like this card because it kind of reminds me I'm just trying to have a good game. Uh, Goblin Grenade, <laughs> absolutely terrific. Love the art. Um, yeah, for cards like this I always go out of my way to pick uh, my favorite art uh, if there are multiples. It's very strong. One to do five damage to a creature flare it clears up a lot. Um, if they have a massive creature that your board wipe won't normally hit, it's a good way of sacrificing a creature beforehand to ensure that it's a full wipe. Hordling Outburst uh, just makes three goblins. Sorcery Speed for three. Empty the Warrens, uh, two goblins with Storm for four mana. And uh, yeah, you can, you can do a lot of fun things. Um, easy way to get an extra few goblins is to use something like Seething Song. This is our only ramp uh, ritual spell, just because I think it's the most efficient, and uh, I've played it for quite a while. And a lot of the good uh, commanders for Mono Red, coincidentally, are five to cast. So Seeding Song has always been one of those cards where it's sort of turn three, and you get your general out a few turns early, and you really start to have a chance at uh, getting some value. Rolling Earthquake. I love Portal 3 Kingdoms, honestly, if it was cheaper as a set, I probably would have bought the whole thing by now. I uh, was really happy with this reprint. This is like Earthquake, except hitting non-flyers, it hits creatures without horsemanship, which is much less common, and uh, therefore better in my opinion. I think people can pretty safely agree on that. It does hit you as well, so you know we only have the Worm Coil, uh, I've had some precarious situations with that card, but ultimately I prefer it. We've got a Blasphemous Act. Uh, this is a great way. We also generate tokens, so this is a nice option because sometimes we can Hordling Outburst, make this cost much cheaper than it should, uh, and then all we've invested is the Hordling Outburst into it, and hopefully our opponents have invested much more, and a spell like Mystic's Mastery again just sort of lets us recoup all of that at the end of the game. Uh, versatility in our control is not something uh, Red is known for, so Fiery Confluence has been a nice addition to the deck. Um, generally, it is for pinging low creatures and destroying artifacts. Um, yeah. Mog Infestation is a sort of unknown, very fun and flavorful card. Um, it destroys all creatures a player controls and puts two 1-1 one -one goblins into play for each creature destroyed. So there's a lot of good things you can do with this, but one of the most common things is to just hit the board for like one. I could hit the board for one for two mana with a rolling earthquake after playing this on my opponent and net a full board wipe. Um, it's investing two cards, but we can also use it on ourselves and then play something like a Goblin Bombardment or a Skirk Prospector um, and generate a ton of mana. So Versatile lets us either double up on our Goblin tokens or take care of someone's board state. Hour of uh, Devastation, awesome card, carryover from Neheb as well. Um, yeah, five damage to all creatures, they lose indestructible, and it hits Planeswalkers for five mana. It doesn't get much more efficient than that, that takes care of almost all Planeswalkers, uh, which is really nice, I chose that over the uh, Magma Quake. May make it into the deck, but I don't play enough Planeswalker decks to find that I need it, uh, to be honest. Uh, Chaos Warp, just because it deals with a permanent. Sometimes it screws you over, but generally you're happy with casting it. A Vandal Blast, just classic EDH. And the final spell is the Mystic's Mastery, uh, which we can overload for 8, allowing us to cast all these spells 
in our graveyard instance and sorcery specifically uh, after exiling them. So great card, great way to end the game. Um, yeah, nothing too busted with it in the deck. The last card that is not land is uh, Duretti. Um, yeah, we have some artifact shenanigans. The filter effect works perfectly with Squee. So, yeah, <laughs> made the cut. Easy peasy. Goblin theme. Uh, everything this deck is about, he's helping out with. Now we're going to go on to the lands. Um, this is one of the, my favorite things about playing monocolor decks is you're allowed to have such a big and useful non-basic land package because you're not stressing out your mana base by doing so. So... Uh, well, non-basic colorless producing, let's say, because uh, there's a lot of good non-basics that add tons of colors. Let's get into it. We've got two here for the Eldrazi. We've got a Temple, uh, which will add two for our Eldrazi spells, and we've got an Eye of Ugin, which is a late game win condition when we can generate a lot of mana, uh, our Eldrazi costs two less, and we're able to tutor them up off of the land. Um, we're, we're good. This is another way for refilling our hand, taking care of permanence. So, nice engine. Um, in a less common slot for removal, which is in the land base. High market, this lets us sacrifice our squee, gain some much needed life, because uh, this is a pretty crazy deck sometimes. Um, yeah, love this card. Kerr Keep lets us produce zero ones, which we can use for a variety of things, drawing two cards, pinging, destroying non basics. I said it all before, but uh, yeah, I. It's a, it's a classic in red and definitely holds its own in almost every deck. Keldon Necropolis. Um, because we sometimes get things like first turn, soul ring, mind stone, or fire diamond, minor crypt, or whatever, um, it's not uncommon for me to be able to activate this on turn three if I have a turn two squee. Uh, which means, despite being highly overcosted, I can make an efficient trade. Uh, depending on what I hit with it, and I'm also putting Squee in the graveyard, which enables my sort of draw engine to begin the following turn. So I found, you know, funnily enough, specifically in this deck, uh, we've got a place for Keldon Necropolis, and I love the Keldon, and uh, Necromancy is one of my favorite types of sorcery, and I'm a big nerd, and blah blah blah. Okay, moving on. Um, the Seiju. Uh, who shelters all. This is how we jam a spell. This is one of the ways, uh, one of the backup ways we deal with counter magic. Red, black uh, are generally two colors that have pretty much no answers uh, to counter spells. You've got two or three weird ones, but that's about it. Um, so Beseju is a great option, other than locking up our turn, so at least that's safe. Ancient Tomb just lets us ramp uh, for the price of life, and uh, that's often worth it if we can get there faster than they can. Command Beacon, you don't want to be playing Squee for 5 or 7, it just feels horrible when what you want to do with him is put him in the yard afterwards. So pretty much after I've played Squee and he's been removed once, unless I'm really hard pressed, I'm using Command Beacon to get him back to my hand instead of paying 5 mana. Homeward Path, because there is nothing worse than investing your whole turn and potentially multiple cards into playing an Eldrazi and then having it stolen from you the following turn. Uh, that is a really quick way to lose the game. So Homeward Path has to be in this deck because we a lot of our investment is in our creature base and we want to make sure those are under our control. Also, if our opponent takes Squee, that's really annoying sometimes. Drownyard Temple, this is just a land that we can discard with one of our effects to draw more cards and then later play um, from the graveyard and ramp with, potentially, if we also had a land drop that turn. So just fit the deck thematically. Gaia Reach Sanitarium with Squee, this lets us uh, essentially draw a card for two mana as long as we have them in our hand, which is a nice way of just getting a little more value. Uh, Mirror in the Mo Moaning Well, I have yet to have sort of a life-saving turn with this, but the idea behind this is if you have enough mana up, if your Paradox Engine is going well, or you've got just enough rocks to hold up the mana for a Mirin, if someone messes with your Eldrazi, if they exile it, gain control, blah blah blah, uh, you can sacrifice it in response and gain, you know, somewhere around 10 life. Um, 
that's the concept of it. I think it will prove uh, super useful as time goes on, but I just haven't played enough games to really have those moments. Uh, last, the colorless producing non-basics is a Mirian landscape. Wow, I'm at 30 minutes. Okay, sorry guys, we've got three cards left. Uh, I love you for watching and, and sharing this passion because uh, I do like going through and making sure everyone knows. I don't usually post the deck list, but I will get around to it sometime. I just am in school and super busy, final term and all. Uh, so this one is going to get us two mountains onto the field. Works well with Valakut. Sometimes I will actually hold it until I will get the double trigger, uh, getting the fifth and sixth land with this card if I have the Valakut in play um, and I'm not stressed on my mana pace. Hammerheim up next. Just a great old legend land. Can remove legendary land walk, uh, or sorry, land walk abilities from a creature until end of turn. Um, surprisingly, has not been useful yet. I feel like it will be, but. I love Hammerheim. Valakut, that's our pinger. That's the one we all know and love. Uh, just need five or more mountains, and every time you play a mountain, you lightning bolt. Forgotten Cave. 35 lands in the deck. Uh, I generally... Whoa, that was some crazy camera work. Um, okay, just deal with it. Just deal with it. We got it. Uh, yeah, 35 lands in the deck. I love running a very tight mana base, being a little risky with it. So I thought uh, 35th land... I wish it could be 24 or 34, but uh, I don't think this deck can do it. So I put in the Forgotten Cave for, you know, a, a, an extra land, but something I can filter out if I don't need it and it's going really well. So other than that, we've got uh, a whole stack of non uh, basic lands. <coughs> I have talked your ear off. That is the deck. Um, this is Squee. I, I don't know, guys. Like, this is honestly maybe the most fun it's up there with baron uh, i've just i really love single color edhs uh, i get to play a lot with the non-basic land base um, i really get to explore the history of the color become familiar with it um, over its history i do like playing multicolor decks i have two made right now you've seen mathis i have another one for you which is uh silas run and timia i probably won't have time to do that today but i will get it to you in the future and uh yeah i hope you enjoyed this is a very very fun deck not super competitive but definitely not casual uh you guys have a great day and i'll catch you next time